I'd like to uh, start by thanking the organizers and the organizing committee uh, for inviting me to give a talk at this uh, incredibly interesting MS symposium. And I'd like to thank David Jones and his team uh, for arranging this uh, across the pond <laughs> recordings um, because of uh, the Delta variant. So I've been asked to talk about the intrathecal B cell and plasma cell biology and MS, a, a, a huge growing topic. So we're going to have to just touch on some things uh, because I know there are going to be other talks or you've already heard other talks in more details about what some of the B cells and plasma cells are doing in the pathogenesis of disease. Um, and I'll try to emphasize some of the things that we've been particularly interested in. In, in my laboratory and my collaborators at University of Pennsylvania, McGill, uh, and uh, elsewhere. Uh, this is my disclosure slide. So again, for this audience, uh, MS is an inflammatory immune-mediated disease. We know this. Uh, with neurodegenerative aspects in both the white and gray matter of the central nervous system. Uh, we now know that, and I'll come to this point several times, as I'm sure others will, that uh, B cells do not just produce Ig immunoglobulins, but they and their progenies can work as regulatory cells, antigen-presenting cells, and uh, we think have direct toxic effects through cytokines and other mechanisms. One of the things we're interested in, you're going to hear a lecture later on on cortical gray matter uh, pathology, but we think B cells may be very important in that, uh, and we've been interested in them as direct mediators of toxicity. Uh, the interest in B cells started with immunoglobulins, and this is a picture of Elvin Cabot, who is my professor of micro and immunology at, at College of Physicians and Surgeons, Columbia University, who first showed the increase in IgG over a percentage compared to total protein, which then led to uh, IgG index, IgG synthesis rate, and oligoclonal bands, uh, the latter work of uh, Lowenthal, Link, uh, Wally Turtlelot and uh, Van Vick in, uh, in Oslo. So B cells and plasma cells in MS, again, briefly, we know that they, we talked a, bit, a little about intrathecal synthesis of immunoglobulins. We know that IgG is in the plaques and can be eluded off as work done by uh, Yar and others at Columbia and then in, in large part by Link and Turtlelot. Uh, we know that a lot of these are antibodies to various myelin components, both in the spinal fluid serum and the eluded material from the brain. Finding a specificity is another issue. It's been a problem. Um, there's a lot of evidence that some of these are antibodies to things that are probably not likely part of MS. Uh, we know that there are plasma cells and B cells in the meninges, and plasma cells don't circulate much if you're normal. So you find them in tissue and bone marrow, um, the meninges in disease, and in the gut are where they're often found. Uh, there's activation of the B cells. I'll show you some data from our work at, when I was at Penn with Arnie Levinson and Bert Zweiman. Uh, we know that there's evidence uh, of long-lasting uh, plasma cells in an inflammatory niche in the, peripheral, in the meninges uh, and the CSF, uh, including work in EAE from Toronto. Um, and um, we know that B cells, including the precursors, enter and leave the spinal fluid. Uh, there's migration recently shown of IgA producing B cells and plasma cells from the gut to the meninges and back out. So that's a very interesting topic because there may be more to the gut microbiome and MS than simply secreted toxins and, and other previous thought of uh, mechanisms by which the gut microbiome may be important in MS and other diseases. So we know from w very elegant work from several groups that there's a commonality in the specificity of the B cells found in the blood and the peripheral immune system and the CSF and meninges, although there are some differences. There are some public uh, B cells and there are some that are restricted. We know uh, from the, originally from the beautiful work uh, from the group in Rome and also in London about the atypical uh, germinal follicles in the meninges, particularly in secondary progressive MS. And we also know that there's, uh, in uh, relapsing remitting MS, CIS, and in primary progressive MS, that there are indeed um, meningeal inflammation, not formed into formal uh, ectopic uh, germinal follicles, but with B cells and plasma cells in there. Uh, and then there's a whole issue about the various B cell mediators and B cell stimulating development agents, uh, mechanisms like BAF, B cell activating factor, uh, in the CSF along with lymphotoxin alpha and uh, CLS, 
XCL13, which uh, are important in the formation of these germinal follicles in B cell and plasma cell differentiation. Uh, we also know a lot of this is because of uh, anti-CD20 agents being found to be efficacious in MS, so there's been a lot of interest in it. And the fact that it's not just immunoglobulins uh, was actually stimulated by the original rituximab studies where you didn't see much change in peripheral and certainly not in the CSF immunoglobulins at a time in which the uh, patients were benefiting both uh, by their MRI scan uh, being less active uh, less gadolinium enhancing lesions uh, and uh, clinically uh, reducing relapses and it didn't seem to have much to do with the levels at least of total IgG, M or A and it certainly didn't seem to matter to the oligoclonal bands. Uh, we also know that B cells are antigen presenting cells and they are very efficient at it because they only present to the particular antigen of interest to them. And we also now recently know that the plasma cells and plasma blasts may actually have regulatory activity uh, possibly uh, interleukin-10 as being one of the ways they and B cells can downregulate things. So B cells are important for uh, both up and downregulating the immune response. Uh, this is a well-worn <laughs> slide that everybody uh, sh shows uh, when they're talking about B cell maturation, but it simply shows the difference along the way, and this is simplified, uh, with different um, uh, expression of different markers and different functional markers on the surface of the B cell as it matures, um, as you can see uh, from uh, immature B cells to uh, naive to memory B cells to germinal follicle B cells, post-germinal follicle, and then uh, into memory B cell and later to plasma blasts and plasma cells. And the markers are important uh, in therapy because um, if you're looking to eliminate uh, plasma blasts and plasma cells, uh, anti-CD19 is, uh, and certainly anti-CD20, is not the answer. So uh, th these things are important. So again, a brief summary again, they're more complex than we thought, besides becoming plasma blasts and making immunoglobulins. They're regulators, they're effectors, uh, they're antigen-presenting cells. And since they are lymphocytes, they can produce cytokines, which interestingly, people are now showing plasma cells do as well. And those uh, cytokines can have up and down regulatory functions and perhaps even cytotoxic functions because there are regulatory B cells that work by killing uh, work out of the University of Michigan in, in general biology. This is a, a diagram cartoon from Selly um, back in 2006, and it shows you uh, the location of both the atypical germinal follicles, uh, including B cells and plasma cells, and a little less organized towards the, uh, your left uh, of the early infiltration, uh, not quite as organized, and of course, the presence of inflammatory cells in the deep white matter. But we and many others are very interested in the ones in the meninges because, as a lot of you know, or most of you know, that there is a good correlation in all but one study that I can think of between the amount of uh, meningeal inflammation and the degree of underlying uh, subpeal uh, layers one through three and four uh, of uh, demyelination, oligo death, and uh, neuronal and axonal uh, damage uh, in the absence of much in the way of inflammation in that piece of the cortex itself. It's the meninges above that seem to have the inflammation. Uh, this is, uh, again, from the group in Rome. Uh, Sarfini, and uh, you can see, uh, I closely looking, you can see there's CXCL13, there's uh, CD20 cells in there, um, and um, we won't get into the whole issue of whether EB virus is activated or not activated and then trigger T cells, but they clearly these uh, look very much like uh, what you'd expect with the germinal follicles. Uh, this is from a, a paper by Claudia Lucanetti and her group at the Mayo, and I'm showing this because these are from patients who had biopsies. So they would actually be considered clinically isolated syndrome or early relapsing MS because they had to have a biopsy by somebody um, who th wasn't sure of the diagnosis at the time. And you can see that there are a meningeal inflammation uh, and there are uh, B cells in there, but not much in the way of the underlying cortex. It's in the meninges. So um, 
I mentioned that B cells, and I mentioned there's not newer data, that plasma cells seem to be more activated in the spinal fluid. Um, and this is early work uh, from our t t my time at Penn with Arnie Levinson and Bert Zweiman and Manghill Sandberg Wolheim from uh, Malmo and Lund. So on this uh, graph, what we looked at was the immunoglobulin secreting cells with plaque forming as assays. And on the left, you see the normal uh, spontaneous amount of from normal individuals' peripheral blood mononuclear cells. In the center, you can see the MS patients' uh, peripheral blood, and you can see it looks pretty much like the, the uh, normal individual's peripheral blood. But if you look at the far right, you can see that there are uh, some very highly activated, presumably B cells and plasma cells, without any further in vitro stimulation that are making a lot of plaque forming cells, um, immunoglobulin plaque forming cells. And these are the same patients in whom we're studying the blood and the spinal fluid. And that would suggest that the, the B cells and maybe the T cells helping the B cells are much more active in the CSF of an MS patient than in their peripheral blood. This is a, another paper in the series that we did. And um, let me get this going. So in, in this table, what you need to pay attention to is the column that says RPMI. That means non-stimulated just culture media. And in the triplicates that you see, the upper, the first one is the spinal fluid cells. The middle one, you can forget, that was some stuff we were doing with co-culturing spinal fluid with the patient's own uh, peripheral cells. And then the third in the trio is the, um, uh, the peripheral blood of that same patient. And if you look in e each trio, the top, meaning the unstimulated CSF B uh, mononuclear cells, are always producing more plaques per cell, because the culture is controlled for cell number, than the blood of the same individual, always. The other columns show that you can then stimulate the blood, and in some cases the spinal fluid more, the cells more in, in vitro, but we're not talking about that right now. But spontaneously, there are more plaque-forming cells per cell uh, in a CSF of an MS patient than their own blood cells. So their B cells, whether it directly or indirectly through T cell activation, are more active in that when you get it from that inflammatory niche. So the question about trafficking back and forth, and there are some very modern, elegant studies showing that by looking at the B cell repertoire and on a, on a basis of genetic markers and, and molecular markers. This is an old study that we also did, uh, uh, Bert Zweiman, Arnie Levinson, myself, and Mankiel sandberg wolheim and collaborators. And what we did is we uh, took patients um, in Sweden who uh, had known MS, who had a baseline spinal tap, and then we gave them a booster of tetanus toxoid, a recall antigen. And what you can see is before immunization, th that's the reciprocal of the titer that you're seeing. So you can see before immunization, nobody really had any CSF antibody uh, of any consequence. Um, one, uh, one subject had one over four. And you can see the serum, and since this is a recall antigen, they haven't been boosted. Some had detectable antibodies, some didn't. But two, four, and six weeks after immunization, you can see that there's antibody in the CSF, and of course the antibody levels went way up in the serum. So you could say, well, maybe that's just leaking across the blood-brain barrier and I suppose some of it could. But if you look at the IgG index and the, I, and the albumin index, there's not much change. In fact, there's no significant change. So if there's a leak, it's not a major leak of albumin and other serum components across to explain the antibodies in the CSF to tetanus toxoid in these boosted, tetanus toxoid boosted patients. And then in four subjects, we were able to isolate enough cells from the spinal fluid and see what they made in the supernatants. So if you just culture them and don't stimulate them in vitro, they're not going to do much. If you culture them with pokeweed mitogen, which stimulates T cells to stimulate B cells, what you'd see if you look carefully is that in, in all of the patients but one, at some point in time, in, in a few cases, uh, a few, few of their samplings, they are now having their, their CSF lymphocytes are producing tetanus toxoid antibodies. So unless you think that the antigen got in and worked on the T cells and B cells that are in the meninges already, the suggestion is that we made, and now this more elegant work later on would support that, is that cells were migrating, especially when activated, into the CSF. And by the way, to an antigen that is not in a, uh, uh, anything to do with multiple sclerosis. And in fact, in work done by Jeff Cohn with Bert Swyman and I, 
uh, Jeff showed that if you Im uh, cause EAE in animals, immunizing with myelin basic protein and also immunizing at the same time with tetanus toxoid, you can find tetanus toxoid reactive T cells in the spinal uh, cord and brain of, um, of animals with EAE. So once the barrier is open with all the chemokines activated, cells can get in that are not necessarily related to the disease. So BAF is a, is a potent uh, factor for B cells and is uh, re Reinterest uh, is, is coming up again in, with the work from, again, the Toronto group. But it's, it's a potent uh, survival factor for B cells, necessary for peripheral B cell differentiation and maturation. It regulates B, C, L2 family members consistent with pro-survival, so it lets them survive. And they're mediated by uh, rece receptors, the BAF receptor itself, whereas there are other receptors for BAF and a related cytokine called April. Uh, and some of those actually can inhi have inhibitory signals. And then the interaction of BAF with its receptors regulates the peripheral immune tolerance of B cells in part. So this is uh, a diagram showing you through B cell maturation where the uh, immunoglobulin receptor, the B cell uh, antigen receptor comes up and the different BAF receptors until you go all the way across the plasma cells. So you can see that the uh, BAF and, and BAF-related receptors and APRO-related receptors, some of them are present at all times across the maturation. So we and others uh, have looked at, um, oh, and the other thing is that excess BAF tends to promote autoreactive B cells. So they, they like uh, high concentrations compared to uh, normal B cells. So this is uh, some work from Sam Uraghib. Um, uh, at uh, Wayne State uh, and also in collaboration with uh, Ilio Scarpini and Daniele Gambetti uh, from Milan, from uh, Hospital Majority. Uh, and you can see the BAF levels in the spinal fluid of MS patients uh, overall isn't very different. And you can see other inflammatory is up. GBS and CIDP is probably leaking across the blood-brain barrier. We don't have albumin indexes in all of these patients. Non-inflammatory, you can see even ALS and Parkinson's are up. Okay, and when we looked at MS blood for BAF increase, uh, we didn't see that as a control for our earlier study with myasthenia. But in the spinal fluid, it's up. And when is it up? So this sort of makes sense with what we think about in the meninges. In patients with secondary progressive MS, think about those follicles, secondary progressive MS would superimpose relapses. That's the double asterisk means a relapse. And the relapsing patients, if we tapped them at a time of a relapse, and if you look at all relapses, you see that they tend to be somewhat higher. So clearly BAF is present. Uh, we didn't find it elevated in the serum of MS patients. Some have, some haven't. Interestingly, John Ichikura and his group in Japan showed the, that BAF was up in both the blood and the spinal fluid in NMOSD, which, which makes some sense too, thinking about where we find the antibody for NMOSD. And I know Jackie Pallas is going to talk about NMO, I think, uh, tomorrow. So when the rituximab paper came out showing that immunoglobulin levels in the blood didn't seem to be the reason that we saw within 12 weeks such a good response in MS patients to rituximab, uh, an editorial that appeared with it by Henry McFarlane in uh, New England Journal of Medicine in 2008 pointed out that the B cells had a lot of things they could do besides make immunoglobulins and become B cells. And one of them that intrigued us and we got Amit Barwar when he was at McGill and now at Penn interested in working with us on this, is that they could conceivably be doing something directly damaging by secreting cytokines or other materials, shedding or secreting. So we, we started by looking at peripheral B, B cells, and we're just getting started at looking at some CSF cells in collaboration with uh, B.B. Belikova at NIH. What we found is that if you take supernatants uh, from unstimulated B cells from the blood of MS patients, uh, they were toxic to oligodendrocytes in culture. Uh, and B cells from normals uh, didn't seem to secrete anything particularly toxic. Uh, there was an increase, uh, no, no damage to astrocytes, and in fact, microglia looked like they were reacting a bit. So that goes with some of the things we know about the cortex in secondary progressive MS. We couldn't find a correlation between cytotoxicity in any one of up to 35 to 37 different cytokines and related uh, proteins. Uh, and we couldn't find any IgM, and later on we found a little, and very much IgG in the supernatants, 
plus the way the cultures are done for both the B cells and for the oligodendrocytes and later for neurons, we inactivate complement. So it didn't seem to be likely to be complement mediated. So we then looked at uh, rat oligos, but, and we also looked at rat neurons uh, and human neurons in culture. And you can see, again, the red bar is the effect of the supernatant on cell death of oligos um, by the MS uh, supernatants, B-cell supernatants, and the green is from the uh, matched age and sex uh, of uh, normal human controls. So what is it? And we don't know yet. So <laughs> some of you who follow this know we haven't figured it out. We're working on it. So one of the things we did was try sizing, and it looked like using progressive um, different filter sizes of different pore sizes, that um, whatever it is weighs more than 300 kDA. Uh, and we didn't think it was IgM, so what could it be? Well, we got together with Paul Stemmer, who runs the proteomics core at Wayne State, and he suggested maybe it could be something particulate like exosomes, which, as you know, is a pretty hot topic in, in almost all of human bi and, and animal biology now, including cancer and autoimmunity. And if you look on the far right, you can see the darker bars are the, um, the exosome prep from the supernatants of MS B cells, and the light sort of yellow uh, are from uh, normal control B cell. And this was exosomes made with a particular extraction kit. So could it be the kit? Well, we did uh, using a different, uh, something by, made by Invitrogen, another different reagent kit, and you can see the same difference. You can see that the dark bars are significantly more showing more toxicity of the individual exosomes made from MS uh, B cells compared to normal peripheral blood B cells. And we also showed uh, using immunoprecipitation of the exosomes uh, that um, with anti-CD9, since CD9 is a constituent of exosome membranes, uh, that the exosomes prepared this way, so three to four different ways of preparing exosomes. Uh, the, the exosomes from the B cell supernatants from MS blood is toxic compared to the exosomes prepared the same way at the same time from B cells from normal controls. So again, not CSF cells yet, that's on, on, the, on the burner. And how do they kill? Well, we showed both the supernatants uh, and the exosomes seem to be killing uh, by, um, um, by apoptosis, not by lytic process, which goes with the fact we've inactivated complement, and we don't think that there's antibody involved in this uh, in particular. So this is using uh, activated caspase-3 uh, to show uh, some oligos dying by apoptosis from the exosome prep from MS, this by the classic ultracentrifugation way of preparing them. Um, but we've shown the same thing, uh, that is the exosomes uh, kill by apoptosis no matter how you make the exosomes, whichever prep method you want to use. So this is from a review uh, done by one of the um, now residents in neurology at Penn, uh, Leah Zuroff, with Amit Barwar, Joyce Benjamin's my partner in crime, and all of this at Wayne State and I. And um, there are similar diagrams from other people in the literature. And what we postulate is that the um, germinal follicles, or in the case of primary progressive MS or early MS, uh, the B cells uh, release material that may be in exosomes, that may be free-floating cytokines, it may be immunoglobulins, but we're interested in the exosomes right now, and uh, that they um, do damage to the underlying oligos and neurons. They can do it directly, presumably, because in our neuronal cultures there are very few other cells, or it could do it by activating microglia um, based on the pathology and based on the fact that we do see activated microglia in some of our early work. So this is and is certainly possible that it's a two-way street. Uh, that is, the underlying microglia may and other cells in the um, cortex may, uh, what they secrete may influence the overlying uh, meninges. So we think, and we, there's a lecture later on in this series about how cortical d damage occurs, but we and others think that um, the, something from the meninges is being secreted. We don't think it's IgG or IgM or complement because you don't find that in the layers one through four in, in these patients' uh, material. Uh, we don't think that it's just by stimulating uh, EBV activation in B cells, stimulating CDAT cells. 
because T cells usually have to be pretty close by their target, and we don't find those in, in the underlying cortex to any degree. So we think, as many others do, that the inflammatory cells, and we're interested in the B cells in this talk and in general in our lab, uh, are secreting, or if you want to say it's an exosome, shedding factors that are damaging the underlying targets. How are they doing that? We'll get to that in a moment, um, but uh, we're not sure as yet. So this is a, a picture of a budding exosome um, uh, from a paper by Edgar uh, in uh, BMC Biology back uh, a few years ago. So there's, you can see the exosomes uh, coming off the surface membrane of the cell producing them. And this is an active production. This is not a leaking. This is um, active production of a, an extrusion. This is sort of a high power view of a cartoon of an exosome. It's been now pinched out of the cell above on the left. And you can see that they're rather complex. So they have both proteins, lipids, uh, and other uh, constituents of the membrane. Uh, and then they have their cargo. So their internal cargo can be other proteins, uh, RNA, including microRNA, DNA, um, and, and again, uh, lipids. So why are the B cells, at least in the blood, we don't know about CSF yet, B cells, why are they doing something, and why are the exosomes doing something that the um, blood B cells, for unstimulated from a normal control, don't do? Well, it could be qualitative. It could be one or more toxic molecules in the exosome in the MSB cell in the blood, and presumably in the CSF, because the, the meninges don't make B cells, so they have to come from the blood, uh, that are not present in controls. Or there could be trophic. We know that BDNF and other things like that, uh, trophic factors, are made by lymphocytes. So maybe, the, uh, maybe there's th they're not in the uh, MSB cell lymphocytes. They're, they're not secreting enough of it in the exosome, uh, and the normals do it. So they're helping the underlying, our cultures and the underlying cortex, you know, in our cultures rather, not, not get damaged. Or it could be quantitative. It could be that there's more of something important in the MS exosome, uh, B cell exosome that is toxic uh, compared to the normal. Or again, it's just less of a trophic factor in the B cell of an MS patient compared to the B cell of a normal control. And then there could be no difference in what's in the exosomes. It may be simply a matter of an activated B cell, and the cells are probably activated in vivo, uh, simply producing more exosomes per cell, per B cell, uh, than the normal. Or in the case of the B cells in the blood, and we are trying to look at this as well, it may be a different proportion of which types of B cells. Remember, we talked about naive memory, cytotoxic killer B cells, regulatory B cells of several types. So it's possible that it's simply a different proportion of which kind of B cells are in the blood and presumably the CSF of MS patients. And there is good evidence, modern, some new nice work that's come out um, from uh, the UCSF group uh, and others that um, the, what you see in the CSF B cells is not exactly the same proportion of memory and things like that as, as in peripheral blood. So that may be part of it as well. So which are the mediators uh, of the exosome, at least in our in vitro system? And hopefully that would be the same ones that would be true in MS in, in the meninges and the underlying cortex. Well, it could be the membrane components themselves, among them ceramide, um, or it could be the cargos. There are cytokines, there are other proteins in there, and it could be RNA, uh, including microRNA, uh, which, as you know, is another very hot topic, uh, because some of those can encourage apoptosis, some of those can block apoptosis. Uh, so those are uh, uh, certainly something that we're, we're, st uh, we're starting to look at. So which proteins? Well, you can make up your list, uh, is, it depends what you like, but certainly cytokines. They may not have been enough in the supernatant to show up when we did our check in our early studies, but they could be the cytokines that are in the exosomes. Semaphorins are of interest. ACE receptor 2, a very au courant protein from, for other reasons. Uh, it could be EB virus proteins, and it could be uh, the PHE HEVW uh, lent, uh, lentivirus proteins, or it could simply be a prion-like effect. It could simply propagate something from one cell to another. 
Uh, lipids, ceramide is known to be cytotoxic to uh, a lot of cell types. Oligos, we've shown it to Schwann cells. Uh, and we know that there's ceramide in the MSCSF. Uh, and then ceramide, in some nice work uh, from the Mount Sinai CCNY group, um, has shown that uh, the CSF of MS patients, and it's due to some of the ceramide, uh, ceramide subsets in that CSF, will affect mitochondrial function of uh, neuronal tissue culture. So there's certainly ceramide is a, is a very good candidate, at least in my opinion. And then I mentioned the microRNA, uh, which is found in uh, free-floating in CSF in MS patients, work um, uh, by several groups, um, including uh, Selmaj and his colleagues in Poland. Uh, or it could be the microRNA from the exosomes uh, could encourage apoptosis or inhibit uh, normal healthy neurons and oligos in, in the cultures. So uh, I started with a picture of Elvin Cabot. So one of my other professors at Columbia was uh, Erwin Chargaff of the base pairs. And his first lecture, he said, when you do scientific research, you start with chaos, you're aiming for truth, but you need to avoid oversimplification, which is something to keep in mind every time we do an experiment and think we know what we're going to find. And then another quote that I like from Marie Curie is that the way of progress is neither swift nor easy. And I'd like to thank you for your attention.